Let's take our Bibles and look together in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 as we continue our study through this epistle of Paul to the Corinthians, Corinth, which was a city in the lower regions of Greece at the time. And Paul was in Greece, but up in a region called Macedonia, probably by today's travel, a simple 200 miles distance, but without vehicles and public transportation and buses, etc., it would have been a couple of days journey at least for him to travel there and the Lord purpose that he be waiting there in Macedonia when he wrote to the Corinthians waiting for Titus to come back with a report of how the congregation was doing such was the heart that the apostle Paul had for these believers to for whom he had preached but here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, my text is going to be from verse 1 down to verse 9. And I want to speak with you about giving unto the Lord. This is a portion of scripture that the Lord has used in my own life over the years as I was delivered from the bondage of so-called tithing, of which I was raised, that you always took 10% of your income and of course it was always a debate as to whether you took 10 percent of the gross or whether you took 10 percent of the net and it was just a pharisaical circus of thinking that somehow if we gave a tithe that we were giving to the lord but as you've heard me explain and you can do this yourself look up the word tithe in your concordance in the new testament never is the church, the New Testament church, ever told to tithe. That is an Old Testament term that was finished and accomplished when Christ finished his work at the cross. It was designed to support the tabernacle and the temple of the day and the priesthood. But now all of that has been done away. So people say, well, then I'm free. I don't have to ever give. Don't worry about it. And I would say, well, if that's your attitude and you don't believe that you need to contribute, then no, keep your dirty money. That's what I say. Just keep it in your pocket. You're not impressing anybody even giving unless it's motivated by the grace of God and the glory of Christ and a desire to see his kingdom prosper because, yes, God has ordained the growth of his church through the death of Christ, but he has also ordained the means, which is through the giving of the Lord's people to support preachers as they go forth and preach the gospel and to see that the work is done. And there are also other needs that regard the church, especially with people. There are times when some are going to be in a greater need than others, and that's the time for us to see what we can do to help. And that certainly was the case here with Paul writing to the Corinthians and encouraging them by the grace of God to give unto the ministry, but particularly for gifts that he was gathering as he worked his way back down to Jerusalem. There was famine, there was suffering, persecution in Jerusalem, and many widows and so these Gentiles were encouraged to give for their Jewish brethren. That's where we see that the middle wall of partition has been broken down between Jew and Gentile, that when Christ died, there's no more Jew or Gentile, but in his body, he has redeemed sinners from every tribe, nation, and tongue, and no one tribe or culture is above another. We're not to exalt people above measure because they're Jews or we're not to look down our noses at some others because they're Gentiles in Christ if Christ paid their debt they are one and the need is the same and so wherever we see that need arise those that are the Lord's are going to desire to provide for that need so here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 
beginning with verses one to five, we have Paul commending the Macedonian congregation for the believers. He says here in verse one, moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record. Yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us much with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. So when he says, moreover, at the beginning of this chapter, you have to realize that the chapter division was put in there. You have to go back to the context. And here Paul is rejoicing from Macedonia, where he was when Titus came back with word of the stability and establishment of the church after Paul had to write some pretty harsh words to them, but the Lord used it to grant repentance and encourage those that were in the church of Corinth to continue to look to Christ. And so he speaks there in the last part of chapter seven of Titus's report and Titus's inward affection for those that he went to see and how the Lord was blessing. And therefore Paul said in verse 16 of chapter seven, I rejoice therefore that I have confidence in you in all things. When he says confidence in you, he's talking about confidence that indeed it was the work of Christ in them and for them. And that's what caused his rejoicing. And then it begins moreover. He goes on to speak of even something more that rejoice his heart. And he begins here speaking to brethren. That's always those that the Lord has drawn together by his spirit and united in the gospel of Christ and the doctrine of Christ. Not everybody's a brother. Well, we're all brothers in Adam, but in the flesh. But as far as spiritually, only those are brethren that God has chosen and that Christ has redeemed and the spirit called. And so he says, we do you to wit or namely of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Here he speaks again of the grace of God. Paul's going to now write about some other congregations and uh, their example in giving of opening their hearts to help those in need that were of the body of Christ. And those are the first words on this subject. And I would say those are important words. When you talk about giving unto the Lord, it flows out of the work of God's grace in a sinner and for that sinner through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the grace of God, we are who we are. And so Paul shows here that he considers both the opportunity and the willingness of these to give a gift because of the grace of God. I truly believe that's the case. It's not that you're sitting around waiting to have a certain amount to give and then you give. No, there's always that willingness to give what you have and recognize that everything that you have is from the Lord anyway. You'll notice here that he even speaks in verse two that these gave out of their deep poverty. I remember traveling in many places in Africa and some of the remote villages where I had to spend some days and there were some pretty poor conditions. But I will tell you that they always gave you the best lodging they could, even if it was a dirt floor. 
And even if it was a bed with a mattress that was full of fleas or bed bugs, if they gave that to you, that meant that was the best they had. I've eaten in some places where we ate out of tin cans, and that was the best they had. Otherwise, they would not have offered it. And so I've learned over time that there are so many that the Lord has blessed because of their desire to hear of Christ out of their poverty they've given. I've experienced that. And it's a reminder to me, too, never to complain about not having enough money or not being able to give. We can't exhaust the resources that God has in getting the gospel out to his elect. And so here he speaks specifically of the churches of Macedonia. That's up in the northern part of Greece, if you'll look there. It was a, a region called Macedonia. The southern part was called Achaia. And the city of Corinth was in the region of Achaia, down in the southern part of Greece. And Paul writes here about the example he sees in these congregations in Macedonia. The churches of Macedonia, you'll recognize the names that were in this region. There was a church at Philippi. There was the Thessalonian church. And there were the Bereans. Those were all congregations that the Lord raised up. And you can read about in the book of Acts how when Paul went through preaching there originally, the Lord had a people that he called out for his own. But you say, well, what was going on here that required their contribution? There was a great, it says there in verse 2 of 2 Corinthians 8, trial of affliction and yet abundance of their joy and their deep poverty. Look at the contrast. Deep poverty, but abundance of joy, but great trial and affliction. You don't normally think about that being an ideal situation, but you know when God ordains things and you realize it, there is that joy even in the midst of affliction. And uh, though it may be poverty, the Lord should take everything from us, yet he does never take Christ. So even in that poverty, whether it's down to the last morsel of bread, we can thank the Lord and rejoice because we know even that the Lord has purposed. So here Paul is reporting, not that he had to, this is some kind of official denominational report, but he's the connection between these different bodies and congregations. I can see how that is easy to do because I have a lot of connections with different congregations throughout the world. And often some will ask me, well, how are the brethren doing over in Malawi or over in Benin or how are the brethren doing over in the Philippines or some other place? Have you talked to them lately? And I can say, yeah, I stay in constant communication. And so it's a joy for me to be able to give a report to those that ask because it's an evidence of how the Lord's working in other places. And that's important for our own encouragement. So here Paul is reporting to these Corinthian believers and giving them an example of the Macedonian believers. You'd say, well, they were in the same country and not that far apart. You would think they could visit one another. Well, again, remember poverty. It wasn't easy to travel, and many lived day to day, and yet they desired to know how those who weren't that far away were getting along and how the Lord was blessing. So the Macedonians, though they were in a great trial of affliction and also in deep poverty, unlike Corinth, which was a thriving metropolis here up where Paul was, it would have been more of a rural area and uh, therefore a lot more poverty. And yet Paul describes them as abounding in the riches, it says, of their liberality. There it is, that what they had, they were willing to give and to share for Christ's sake. There's no greater joy 
than that. But why did Paul write about giving at all? That might be the question you're asking. What was he collecting this money to do? Well, it's clear as you read on in 1 Corinthians that Paul was collecting money to help the believers that were in Jerusalem who also were very poor. A lot of times when you think of Jerusalem, you think, well, that would have been a rich center. No, Jerusalem had known much persecution and particularly at the hand of the Romans. The Romans kept a heavy hand on Jerusalem because it was the center of the Jewish culture at that time. And so the government would tax and uh, impose restrictions on the Jews to keep them from getting too strong. It goes all the way back to Egypt. Egypt. You remember when Pharaoh was concerned about the children of Israel giving birth to too many and the population growing. He increased their work and made them labor. Well, this is what the Romans would do with these. And so it, it pretty much subjected them to poverty most of their lives. If you look in 1 Corinthians, this is 2 Corinthians, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. You can see where in his first epistle, Paul wrote that he would be coming through Corinth and uh, that anything that they had determined to give that they wanted him to carry to Jerusalem on his way, then he would gather the gift. That's what he was speaking of there in 2 Corinthians when he wrote. Look at 1 Corinthians 16. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia. So this was a communal gathering of gifts. Even so do ye upon the first day of the week, that's when they gathered for worship, let every one of you lay by in, in store as God hath prospered him that there be no gathering when I come. Paul is saying that he didn't want to spend his time collecting money when he came because his purpose would be to preach the gospel. So this is something that they could take care of before he got there. But he said, when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring your liberality on Jerusalem. He's saying there that he didn't want to be the one necessarily gathering the money, but that he wanted others to be appointed to take the money for him. And he said, if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. And so that's a little bit of the background here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 concerning this gift that was to be taken to the church in Jerusalem. You can read a little bit in the history of Greece about the poverty of the Macedonians and uh, the wars that were going on. This was an area where it was, there was constant conflict between Rome and Greece. It was one of the strongholds of Alexander the Great. In fact, it was his former homeland. And so the Romans made sure that those from this area, the Greeks particularly, never got above a good poverty level because the Romans didn't want them getting strong again and, and trying to overthrow the Roman government. <clears throat> but in that turmoil, in that affliction, here God is causing the gospel to be preached. And he says there, for I bear witness in verse three, Paul knew that the Macedonians would give in one of two ways. First, they would give here, as it says, according to their ability, in the sense that in total, their gift may not be very much. And if somebody looked at it, yet he was confident that what they gave would be like the widow's might. And uh, each gave according to their ability. That's what he means there when he says in verse 34, to their power, I bear record, or to the ability, according to the ability that God 
gave them. None of us have any power in ourselves. Everything we have is from the Lord. And so that was the first way that he knew they would give. But secondly, it would, even though it was not a large gift in the sense of, of a dollar, a dollar sense, yet he knew that their giving was, as he says there, they were willing of themselves. Some would call this a free will offering. We know that it's not speaking of our will having any freedom of choice at all, but where God directs in the heart to will and to do of his good pleasure, it is done willingly and without constraint. And that really is the foundation of giving unto the Lord. You don't put requirements on people as to what they give. And I don't know what people give. I just know that the Lord's taking care of his work. And sometimes there are large gifts that come in, but sometimes there are small little gifts. But you know, each one I value because I know it's the Lord that purposed that each one that has given, that they should give what they give. We have that account in Luke chapter 21. We won't go over there now, but of the widow's might. And she only gave two mites, which would be like our penny, so to speak, which would have been a very small amount of money. And so in that sense, she was giving according to her ability. But even beyond that, she gave all she had. If you stop and think she gave two little mites and here were these other Pharisees blowing their trumpets before the temple and gathering people around and giving larger sums, but the Lord commended this widow's might because she had given all that she had and uh, didn't even keep one might for herself. Such was her trust that the Lord would care for her. And I believe that's what it is to give willing. You're not counting to say, well, if I give this and that only leaves me that, I would say if that's on your mind then put your wallet away, put your money away. Don't break the piggy bank for that. Now, this is not to be a contrived or calculated way of giving. When the Lord's in it, you give. And I've just learned over the years, you can't outgive the Lord. You know, we sing that song, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mind. And uh, I just believe that that's how God blesses and does it. I was buying something the other day. And after I bought it, got talking, and the lady wanted to know what I did. I told her I was a gospel preacher and everything. She said, oh, well, you should have told me. He said, most preachers come in here and ask for their discount. And I just looked at her. And I said, no, I said, I don't, I don't serve a poor God and I'm not going to try to wiggle, you know, people down to give just because I'm the Lord's servants. He's taking care of me and I'm just happy to pay what's fair. And that's it. That's true. So that's how we're to give. It's, it's freely willing and according to the need, and that's why Paul says there in verse four, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift. Isn't that interesting? It's not Paul imploring them to give. It's them imploring Paul to take the gift because of what they had heard about the need and uh, doing so with much urgency. Paul says that we should receive the gift. He, did, he wasn't out there begging for money. If you hear men begging for money or talking about their projects, you know, I have had people come through here over the years and ask, how do you take care of your bills? How do you, what do you do? I said, preach Christ. He takes care of his business and God's not a beggar God and nor does he send his servants out to beg. If God has purposed it, he'll provide it. I've seen that over and over again. And we just continue to look to him. But here in this case, as I said, instead of Paul begging them, they are begging him. They are imploring us, it says, to receive the gift. That means that it was the Macedonians who were urging Paul for the privilege of giving and not Paul who begged them for money. So the Macedonian church, even though it didn't have much to give, 
In fact, if you look around, there's a lot of money in false religion. And that's what attracts people because of the big buildings and budgets and all these things. They can't believe that a, a small congregation can have such an influence around the world as even what we do when people drive by. It doesn't look like much, but the Lord's doing his work and the gospel is being preached throughout the world through <clears throat> small means. And that's how God has purposed that he might get the glory. And so the example of the Macedonians is proof of, as it began, the grace of God. It wasn't anything that they were being required to do, but willingly they were giving because of the grace of God. Now, when Paul says there in verse 5, as this they did, not as we hoped, what is he talking about there? The Macedonian believers actually gave far beyond what Paul had hoped. That's what he's saying. Whatever he had in mind that, okay, this would be something that they could do, he is saying it was well beyond that. It's not like, oh, no, they didn't give enough. No, not as we hoped. It's in the sense that they gave far more than what he could have ever imagined. And here was his rejoicing. You notice in verse 5, that first they gave their own selves to whom? The Lord. That's what's important. You know, I've never passed an offering plate. People like to make a big deal of that and call it their time of worship. And they bring the ushers down and pass the plate around and puts people under a scrutiny. You know, some feel obligated to reach in and give something. We don't do that. We have a little box in the back. In fact, I've had people that have come up to me after they visit a while and they say, well, if you want to give, how do you give around here? I said, there's a little box back there. It says offering, and you put whatever the Lord directs in your heart. I don't know what people give. I don't want to know. I'll tell you what rejoices my heart more than anything is that there are those that have, first of all, given them own selves to the Lord. Now, we know None can give themselves to the Lord, but what the Lord has drawn them, none can come except it's been given of the Father. But that's my rejoicing. I'd rather that, that people come and sit and listen and rejoice in the message of Christ, whether they ever give or not, financially. The Lord's going to take care of his work. The important thing is that there are those that the Lord is drawing and uh, they have given themselves to the Lord. And then you see the second part of verse five, and unto us by the will of God. Those that the Lord has drawn to himself, they love God's preachers. People can't understand that. How on earth, what's the preacher doing to cause people to love him so much? It's not what the preacher is doing. It's his message. It's Christ. And so in that, they go together. Where? You see, ones giving themselves to the Lord, they'll give themselves unto his servants to follow them. It's not We're not men followers, but as Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. They know that the Lord has raised up these preachers to be their leaders and to nourish their souls with the message of Christ. And so they not only trust Christ, but they trust the preacher that every time they gather, the preacher is going to direct them and point them to Christ. So in giving, the real issue isn't giving money. If I haven't made myself clear, I'm trying by the Lord's grace to make it clear. It's giving ourselves to the Lord. That's why I said, keep your dirty money. If you feel an obligation in any way, don't give. Just hold it. But... The important thing is, what think ye of Christ? And don't worry about what anybody else is thinking. What think ye of Christ? That's what's vital. And if any truly do give themselves to the Lord, then everything else will flow from there. The love for the preacher, the support of the work, all of that will be according to the Lord's purpose. And so in verses 6 through 8, we see how Paul tenderly encourages these to give as they had purposed. 
He says there in verse six, in so much that we desire Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all diligence and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. So here, Paul's associate, Titus. See, Paul wasn't seeking all the glory himself. He had those that the Lord had raised up to work alongside of him, labor with him in the gospel ministry. Maybe perhaps not as well known as Paul, but that didn't matter. And uh, it would have been Paul or Titus that would have been the bearer of this letter that he wrote to the Corinthians and took to them and it was designed to encourage the Corinthian believers and then in return that they would give Titus the collection and that he would then in turn give it to Paul so he was to make certain that they actually followed through on what they had intended to do earlier it's always good to have accountability when it comes to money you know, anybody that gives here, I might collect it, but I send it on to our treasurer and they ensure that everything gets taken care of. I don't sit down and write checks, nor do I care who has given and who hasn't. The treasurer takes care of that at the end of the month or at the end of the year, providing a report. But there's, there is accountability because it's the Lord's money. And so we might imagine here that these Corinthian believers were willing to take up a collection for the saints in Jerusalem and give that money to Paul to take with him to Jerusalem. But when things became difficult between Paul and the Corinthian congregation, you remember that was the purpose for his writing as he did, they may have been then less willing to take up the collection and put it in Paul's hands. It's funny how people are. Sometimes they're willing to give and happy as larks. And then if you say or do something contrary, and all of a sudden you're their enemy. And so Paul encouraged them to give it to Titus. One reason Titus was sent with his letter was to complete this grace, is the way Paul put it there in verse 6 that he also would finish in you the same grace. Back in 1 Corinthians 16, they had already determined to set aside a certain amount. And so now Paul's saying, don't let me be the hindrance. Whatever grievance you have against me and find fault in me, still it's the Lord's work. And uh, Titus would be the one that would collect that and, and bring it. Complete this grace. But what they intended to give by grace, and I... We'll say that whatever grace starts, it finishes. And yet they may have thought about that giving and they may have been favorable to the idea of giving. And yet they needed to complete what they had said. People say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And I will tell you our intentions or our vows or our resolutions are really useless how many times have we determined to do something and before the end of the day we've completely forgotten about it such is our nature but where the grace of god directs that whatever the lord brings to mind i always say do it right away if the lord's brought it to your mind maybe i need to sit down and write that letter or maybe i need to pick up the phone and call so and so do it right away Follow the five second rule. As soon as it's in your mind, do it. Because if the Lord's brought it to mind, then finish it. Do that which he has directed by his grace because we're to be an encouragement to one another. He told them here that as you abound in everything, verse seven, and notice he's not even speaking financially. And some think, well, maybe Paul's being sarcastic here when he says, as you abound in everything, everything else, 
you're proud of your faith, your utterance, your knowledge, and all diligence. But I don't believe he was being sarcastic. I believe he was reminding them of all the things that they abounded in by the grace of God as a congregation. Beginning with faith, the fact that they have the revelation of Christ through the gospel in the faith and utterance and knowledge, being able to teach others, all of these things, the Corinthian church was well grounded in, and Paul reminds them of that. So it's as if to say the matter now of collecting and giving to the saints should flow out of that. He calls it this grace also. See there at the verse, verse end of verse seven, grace upon grace. It's not a different type of grace required for giving than the grace for believing. It's all the grace of God in Christ. And so for the fourth time since the beginning of this chapter, if you're counting, Paul refers to giving of this gift as a grace, the grace of God to receive the gift, to complete this grace. And so the fact that Paul uses that ancient Greek word charis to describe even financial giving, it means that the ability to give and the heart to give is a free gift from God. It's like none of us could believe were it not for the work of grace in the heart. None of us could give with an open hand, sow the seed openly, were it not for the same grace of God given from the heart. And that's why Paul said in verse 8, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others. In other words, he's not going around telling them what to give or what to do, but as he had heard, they were willing to give, so to give. And in essence, testing their sincerity, sincerity of their love and diligent for others. Paul here makes two important points. First, giving can measure the sincerity of your love, as it says there, to prove the sincerity of your love verse 8, but second, to compare the giving of the Corinthian church to the giving of the Macedonians. He wasn't trying to pit one against the other, but testing the sincerity of their diligence toward others. And again, we're not to compare ourselves one with another, but with doing as God directs by his grace. And then verse 9, which is really a huge scripture text to consider. And I'll probably come back to this more next time. But you talk about an example of giving. It's not just in what we see in the Macedonian congregation. But Paul, in verse 9, gives the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we think about what he has done and the grace of God revealed in him, there is no greater example that we could have than that of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, for ye know, so there the four is coming to a conclusion here, for ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. You see the comparison here were these Macedonians who were under great trial of affliction and yet out of deep poverty were willing to give to the saints in Jerusalem. But by what example, by what motivation? Here it is in verse 9. No greater example than that of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you can see from the context and from how Paul has used the word grace in this passage, we know what Paul means. He, he says, you know the giving. That's that word grace. Grace gives. I know people quote John 3, 16 all the time. For God so loved the world that he what gave his only begotten son. Unconditionally. For a world of sinners that he had chosen to save ethnically, Jew and Gentile. And so no greater example than that of the Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, 
that's what I want us to come back to next time. I'd like to look at this in comparison with Philippians 2, 5 through 11 that you can read as the Lord directs. But when was our Lord Jesus rich? We know that on earth he had nowhere to lay his head. But before he took on human flesh and walked as God on this earth, he enjoyed all of the riches of the glory of heaven and the Father. And yet, as Paul wrote to the Philippians, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, who being in the form of God, condescended to take on the form of a servant and come and lay down his life. So he who was rich, yet... He condescended to come to this earth, and it's a picture of infinity taking on finiteness. The divine stoop, God in the flesh. He didn't cease being God, but as a man, he relied on nothing of his divinity other than his Father upholding him to accomplish the work that he came to do. And so, here we see Paul attesting to the Lord Jesus Christ and his preexistence. There's no way that he could refer to him as being having been rich unless it had been as he was before he came to this earth. And oh, the riches, we sing that hymn, out of the ivory palaces, he came. And what majesty and glory surrounded him. I'll close with this one verse here in Psalm 45, and then we'll come back to this because I want us to see how this is the whole anchor, really, of everything that we are. It's the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can't say enough about him. And if we ever get a cockamamie idea that somehow we're somebody because of what we give, well, we need to be knocked down a level or two because Anything we do is nothing compared to what the Lord has done to pull us up out of the quagmire of the dunghill of life where he found us and placed us as princes with him in the heavenlies because of his work. But here in Psalm 45, this is called a song of loves, and it really is how the father had loved his son and yet how in Christ his people are loved. Psalm 45 and verse 8, it says, All thy garments smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia out of the ivory palaces whereby they, are made, they have made thee glad. King's daughters were among thy honorable women. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen of gold, Ophir. Hearken, O daughter, and consider and incline thine ear. Forget also thine own people in thy father's house. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy Lord, and worship thou him. That's what it's all about, worshiping the Lord with all that we have. We'll draw a line there for now. Pray the Lord will bless what we've heard. Amen.